Soundstripe. This podcast is for educational purposes only. We are qualified clinicians who will cover various topics on mental health and will sometimes provide community resources. We are not being paid by any organization for our content and any information we provide is general and pertains to our own personal experiences. We do not, I repeat, we do not provide psychotherapy, diagnoses, or treatment recommendations on air. Any concerns related to your individual mental health should be directed to your medical and mental health professionals. We are not responsible for others' decisions or the subsequent consequences. So I was on TikTok and I saw this video. You're nothing but the best, but I can't be the only person who is like, why her? I genuinely feel like if more people just flat out admitted when they're jealous of someone, we would have a lot less problems. A lot less problems. When I saw that, I was like, oh, I know what she's going through. And she's not jealous of that girl. It's something else. And I promise you, if not her, it'll be something else. And that's exactly why you got to stop looking at people and the things that they accomplish. Be happy for them. Root for them on the sidelines. And really get down to the root of the why you're jealous. What I'm saying is utilize that jealousy to get down to the root. Find out what the real problem is. And try to deal with that. Because jealousy really has fueled some incredible things. Jealousy has gotten me off my butt, motivated me to do things I didn't even know I was capable of doing. So channel it into a way you don't even realize you actually could. I promise you, you can do it. This video basically was about jealousy and envy um, and how we take those emotions and technically we use them not as I want to say in a positive light, but this video kind of showed ways or explained how we could use jealousy and envy in a more positive manner. Oh. It specifically talked about how a young white girl from, I believe, rural Ohio uh, was able to grab these endorsements and basically became an overnight success um, during Rush Week. And if you don't know what Rush Week is, it's basically a week where sororities, predominantly white soror sororities, um, do their whole thing all week where everybody gets accepted in. And I don't know much about it, but I'm assuming that's what it's about. Um, and during Rush Week, a girl named... Kylan Darnell, I think that's how you say her name, uh, was given all these endorsements or got all these endorsements from a lot of people. And a lot of black creators, I'm going to say a lot, a few black creators felt a certain way about it. And uh, this creator, uh, there was another black creator, uh, was able to talk about how we can use jealousy and envy as a way to uh, I guess, reflect on that and be motivated by it versus being upset about it. So I would like to talk more extended conversation about jealousy and envy itself, those specific emotions and how we can use that. Well, for me, whenever I hear like jealousy or envy, like if I, if I see someone that has something that I want, or if I see someone that I'm jealous of, cause those are natural feelings. Like they're not necessarily negative everybody's going to feel it at one point. I don't care if you say, I don't, I never get jealous of anybody and blah, blah, blah. At some point you see somebody being successful or having something that you want. And I mean, you can be jealous of that. But for me, that's more of like motivation to like get up and do something about it to get to that point or to get that thing. I don't look at it like, oh my God, this person got this. I can't believe it. They don't deserve it. I'm not going to lie back in the day, like in college, I might have been like that, but there's some growth here. Um, and so now it's just motivation for me. It's like, okay, this person has, you know, um, a good relationship and, you know, I want that. It looks like they're, they're happy. I want that. I'm going to put in my work in my relationship to get to that point, to get to where I am happy and, and feeling good about it. So it's not like, oh, they have that. I wish they didn't have that. I wish the worst on them because I'm, I'm envious and I'm jealous of it. Like, no, I'm going to do what I got to do to get that thing, to get to that point, whether it's material things or not. Like, that's just how I look at it. Yo, I never felt jealous of nobody, right? I don't be caring. Like, I don't care. So even growing up, like, we didn't have everything. Like, we, you know, so a lot of times my situation was raggedy, but I was always like, it's a way out. Like, I'm always, I'm going to get out. I'm going to get out. And I've always felt like that. And so I've always like used stuff as a motivator because if it's, if it's for me, it's going to be for me. 
I never felt jealous growing up. As an adult with these kids, I be hating on people who have those parents that'll be like, let me take the kids for the summer. Let me do this for the summer. Because then I'm, I'm that's that's what I be hating on. Um, Because I'm just like, dang, man, I wish, you know what I mean? Do you know the things I could do? Like, while I don't have um, my five kids with me, at least for, even for a week, because I have a hard time being away from them. But even for a week, like, if I had that, like, do you know what I could do? Or like those, those grandparents, and not that my, my kids have deficient grandparents, but just those grandparents that are like everything for the person. Like I had to write a whole dissertation and I'm waking up hours early just because I don't have a reprieve. I don't have somebody to step in for me. And so for stuff like that, I'm always like, man, I wish I had that, but it's never to the point of where I wish ill on anybody else or I care about what anybody has. Cause I mean, I'm in my own bag most of my time. But you saying you always been like that, or that's just a a recent thing? Jealous? No, like, like you always just didn't care. Like you never looked at anybody and been like, "Damn, I really want what they have." Like that's crazy mm -mm. that I don't have that. No, and let me tell you why I don't why I don't want what people have because you never know what it takes for people to maintain what they have. And a lot of times people looked at me and thought, you know, oh, she has this, she has that. She has her dad in the house. She has, you know, her parents are together for a certain amount of time and they don't know what kind of suffering went on in my home. You don't know what kind of suffering is going on in somebody's marriage. Um, you don't know what kind of man or woman that person is married to. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I just, for me, I'm like, okay, everybody has a level that they have to go through to keep what they have. And so do I want to switch out what I have for what they have? That's what jealousy is for me. I don't know. I don't, I've always been like that. I told you what I'm jealous of. Okay. So I, I come at this very different. So I've been jealous as a, I had jealousy as a child with certain things. Um, and you know, envy and en being envious of other people is something I've experienced growing up for sure. But growing up, those particular feelings and traits were seen as negative. They were taught as negative. You, don't, you shouldn't be jealous of anybody. You shouldn't be envious of anybody. If you went to church, these were two things that were, these were negative. They were always negative. So for years, they were negative. So I would try very hard to not be jealous of other people or to not be envious. But now, over the course of the last few years, I have done what is known as a lot of shadow work. Shadow work is a intervention in um, mental health where you literally work on those darker recesses of your mind. You literally embrace them. So now I'm at a point where I embrace every part. When I say every part of me, jealousy, envy, rage, anger, there is no negative emotion when you when you do shadow work. It's just the part of it. You acknowledge it, you embrace it. And you move on and it can be motivating. A lot of the negative traits can have positives to them. And we don't see that because we're taught that they're just negative. So I do a lot of shadow work with my clients and it benefits them a lot because you can't totally repress a whole part of yourself and learn to love your full self. So you have to acknowledge those parts because you can't get rid of your shadow anyway. Yeah, and it's interesting to me how, well, I just, I thought that, like, all people felt jealousy and envy. Like, I just, I thought it was just a natural emotion. And like Ash is saying, like, we're taught that it's a negative thing. So we try not to do it or try not to have those feelings to the point where sometimes it, it's not healthy mm -hmm. mentally. Um, but I, I really just thought that everybody had those feelings every now and then. We just all handle it differently or we all look and at I, it differently. But and the way I look at it is I'm going to push forward and be more motivated to get that thing than I am going to be sitting here hating on somebody and just sitting in one place hoping and to have a lot of a lot of like so so-called experts or people in this field, psychiatrists, psychologists, people who do this type of work, they would see somebody like Auntie Suge and they would say, "No, it's there. It's just she learned that it was incompatible with who she chose to be. So she chose not to be jealous. It's there. She made a conscious decision not to be that. So it got relegated 
to her subconscious. I'm not going to be jealous, so I'm not jealous. It's not that it's not there. It's that she made a choice to not embrace and exude it. So here's going to be, <laughs> this may be weird, but I used to get jealous about like the way like kids were able to have like their parents come to their like events when I was younger because I was an athlete when I was younger and in track and field and everybody's parents got to come and be there but my parents never came and so that caused me resentment toward my mom because I would always say like why don't my mom work as hard as other parents and that really that really it it messed not messed up the relationship between me and my mom but I often got upset with her a lot because I was jealous of what the other kids were able to get and have and I was not able to do that and so but someone told me one day they said Keisha your mom was able to give you what she had at the time and it's it's changed the game for me ever since right and so I started to reframe how I thought about all the times my mom had to be at work and I didn't know that or all the times that and I like how Suge talked about you don't know what people have to maintain to you know to keep where they're at and so for me I had to realize that my mom didn't have the resources at the time to get the things that I needed to be like to be in the groups of the other kids. I didn't know that. And so that really, really changed my perspective on being jealous of other people because you don't know what they got. I don't even know, even if the people who had it at that time, hell, they might not have had it. Cause you know, people like to look house rich and be really poor. And so that really changed, that just changed my perspective on having those jealous feelings because I don't know what it's like. To, you don't know what it's like for that other person to have what they have or what they're doing to maintain that. And maybe once I find out what they had to do, I'm going to be like, oh, no. Maybe that's not what I want after you figure out, like, ooh, no, that that, that I'm, I'm not cut for that. So I often think that that's th having those emotions are definitely valid. Uh, but I do think that there may be some other things going on that people need to know some additional information about before they fall into the trap of it affecting you negatively. Um, and I, and I, I definitely agree with what Shug said. Keach, honestly, like when I was young, I learned a lot of things early and a lot of it because, cause I was exposed. And so like, I, like Auntie Ashley said, like it could have been, you know, my shadow or feeling those feelings, but I, I mean, as a kid, if I'm not embracing them feelings and I'm learning stuff as a kid that, that adults don't even know. So I'll pat myself on the back for that because I've never, I, I, I remember having friends who could have every pair of Jordans out there or who could have every nice outfit out there. But then I'm looking, I'm like, well, okay, look where they live. Well, look what their parents are going through. And so like whenever, and look what they go through. And so I understood from that perspective. And then like, um, I just, I don't know, like I, I just kind of learned and I worked through a lot of things like internally. And then I didn't, I didn't know what to call them back then. And that's what they said, like, when we first started starting our counseling program, like, you didn't know what to call it back then, but you, as a child, were already gearing yourself up to be um, a helper because of going through everything that you went through. And so it just helped me, like, I evolved. And then, like, I remember somebody being jealous of me about something, and I'm like, for what? You don't know what I go through every single day. You don't right. know what I'm doing to maintain this. You don't know um, what I had to do to get it. You don't know anything. All you know is that you think that you want what I have, and that's a mistake. I I would agree. I would agree with that, Shug, because a lot of people will come out and say, oh, Keisha, you're so successful. You're so this. And I'm like, girl, do you know I literally almost was in the hospital because I had infections in my body to get to where I am? Do you know I had to sleep at night, like, crying because I had nobody else to talk to when it came to me trying to get on this doctoral journey by myself. Do you know my mama was a single mom and we had to live off welfare and there were times me and her got into fights because I wanted this and she couldn't afford it? Like, it's not what you think it is. Like, I had to bust my ass to get to where I am. Are you sure? <laughs> Are you sure? I, well, the one thing, thing that I remember <laughs> but whether you from my master's program was when we learned about the wounded healer. 
nearly all therapists are wounded healers. That's how we can empathize. That's how we're able to, you know, meet these clients where they are. Like we have, we have our own wounds and people don't realize that. And so I definitely agree. People, jealousy in and of itself, you don't know what came with what that person has. You, you don't know what they had to do to get there, like y'all are saying. And then people learn and grow differently. Because like Keisha, you said with your mom, you came to that place where it was like, you didn't realize. I can't remember exactly what you said someone said to you. But mm -hmm. for me, that's my dad. My, my dad. I was jealous of anybody who had a present father. So all my cousins who had their dad there, because my uncles were great dads to their kids for the most part. And so, like, my uncles would try to fill that void for me, but it's not the same. So it was that way for me with my dad. He just And see, I took it differently. Even as an adult, I take it differently. And that could be because I have worked on my shadow self. I look at it like, yes, you couldn't be there all the time. I get that. I get that that's not possible. But I'm not, like, this is why when Nick Cannon came up, I was like, money doesn't matter. The, the money that a parent spends on you doesn't matter. Because that presence will, will outweigh that for most people. So with my dad, it's like, you could have showed up. Like, I can't, I, I haven't grown to the place yet where I can give any adult a pass. Because I'm like, there could have been one time out of 10 where you prioritize me. And so I'm still in that space. It, it's, it, it still comes off sometimes as, yes, I understand. I understand that life happens. I understand that things happen. I understand you had to provide. But one time out of 50, you could have showed up because you have people who, whose parent, whether mother or father, just never showed up. And that's very hard to wrap your mind around, even as you grow up, even as you become an adult, because life is hard for us as adults now. I got four kids. I cannot be there for all of them all the time. It's impossible. But I try my hardest. So I look back at it like I try. This, this, is what, this, is what I, this is what I'll say to that. And I always say this, having kids change me in that respect as I'm starting to grow. Because I used to always be like this too. Well, why, why wasn't this person there? Why wasn't that person there? Why didn't this person do this? If you put yourself in those same exact shoes, would you show up or would you not show up? Or why? Because there's always a why. And so as far as like looking at my parents, I'm like, well, you know what? Back then, like Keisha said, back then she couldn't come. She couldn't come. She had to work. And so, okay, I could have came to your stage performance or we could keep the lights on. Which which do you prefer? And kids don't understand from that perspective. And then kids don't understand the 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 hard relationships between two adults. Not and I don't know anything about, you know, your situation with your mom and your dad, but a lot of men and, you know, women I would say women too, treat the kids how they feel about the other person. And so there could have been some of that in there. Like there's just, there's always a why. And so I would say to anybody, even who feels like Auntie Ashley or like any of us, that's when you sit down and you talk to that parent, like, well, why wasn't you there? And then just think about it. Okay. What about if it was me? Because you always care about stuff more when you put it in context that you care about, True. which is yourself. And I've actually asked my dad that. Well, we've had these conversations. Me and my dad have pretty, a pretty decent relationship now that I'm older. And we've had these conversations. And the thing is, his response to me is why I'm still on this wave. Because his response was, once your mother and your grandfather told me they didn't need me to be there, I just backed up. I will never be able to accept that. Ever. There's always a why. There is always a why. And <clears throat> I know that's Auntie Shug's favorite thing to say. Y'all going to hear her say that every episode all the time because there's always a why there's always a but why right but why is this person doing this why is this person acting like this why is this person thinking like this and i think this draws us perfectly into our main dish for today because when it comes to individuals who use drugs there's always a why there's always a reason for this and um if you saw our mini earlier this week uh, auntie shug explained beautifully what addiction was and at what point it changes from being a choice to not being a choice and a lot of people don't understand that so we're going to talk about that here in our main dish hope to change the mindset and the perspective a little bit but let's get it let's get ready to eat and leave no crumbs y'all soundstripe
All right, y'all. So let's segue into addiction. Um, I wanted to talk about addiction specifically. It's a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. I was a child of an addict. And when I tell you that the reason why I did talk about not being jealous of somebody is because I knew what I was going through in my private household myself. So I knew that no matter how good things looked on the outside, that on the inside, they were not always peaches and cream. And when you're the child of an addict, I feel like children of addicts suffer more than the addict themselves and a lot of the other family members because we're still trying to live our lives. We're still trying to grow into who we're meant to be, but you have to grow under the strain of somebody else that's sick. Oh, wow. I I like that, Should Got to grow underneath. Wait, would you say grow under the strain of someone who's sick? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I was also a child of an addict father as well um and a lot of people did not know that um growing up he was in and out of you know prison and stuff of that nature but i never really talked a lot about my father now as an adult he we have a great relationship we've always had a great relationship whenever whenever he was around but this year i got to uh they do um what are the uh, speaking at a and a like those meetings and so this year i got to see my dad speak at meetings or uh what, i forgot they call the them NA something meetings. but i can't remember uh, yeah the aa meetings but they they call it something but i can't remember but did you go to al -Anon to, or nar -Anon? i think it's okay. i think it's al -Anon. i think it's that um but i got to see him speak for the first time this year and he is currently three years sober um, and he taught and during his speech, <laughs> he didn't know I was coming. So I came to surprise him, me and my aunt. And he was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to say some things that you don't know that I've done. And he did say some things that I was caught off guard by, mm -hmm. but he was like, those are the things that I was doing under the influence. And while I'm not, he said, not, while he was not proud of those things, it was, he got, he found his life with God and his life is now turned around and he is now studying to be a peer recovery coach. So and he, and I asked him about getting his L, uh, LCDC, not licensed chemical dependency license. So um, I, he was like, yeah, I was thinking about that, but he knows I'm in the mental health field. And so I'm very, it, it is very hard to have a father not in a home and people not understand what it's like to have a parent who's addicted, who's addicted, but it also is very good to see them on the other side of things. Now, granted, I was not exposed to a lot of things he was doing, but I know that I'm seeing the hard work he's put in now as an adult to be sober. I wanted, I wanted to uh, say that uh, I want to kind of piggyback off, off what you were saying, Keish. The same exact thing. Like my dad's been sober for like maybe 14 years. It's been a long time. And um, I'm so proud. When I tell you I am so proud of him, like he's um he's in the mental health field also. And he works for the VA. And so like if you ever seen like somebody get turned completely around, I'm in awe. And I when I when I was doing my graduate program, I was like, I don't want to work with nobody with addictions. I don't care. I was so callous. And so hard hearted about it that I didn't want, I didn't even want to look at nobody with an addiction. That's the only place on the island of Oahu that would accept me for, for an internship. And so there I was. That's, that's your destiny. <laughs> yeah, it was. And I was sitting in there and that's the only place that would accept me. I started learning the psychoeducation about it. I learned so much about the brain and addiction. Like it was just ridiculous. And I started looking at him like, Wow, you know what I mean? I'm sorry. I was sorry because it was like I was judging you. I was going off and talking about you and I felt a kind of way about you because of what you did to me. But you 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 wasn't in control. Now, the first time it was a choice, right? But after that, your brain was hijacked. It's not it wasn't my fault. It wasn't you know what I mean? Like you you did what you could do. Uh, well, I was gonna say I, I I didn't have a parent who was addicted, but I did have I remember. Sorry, I did ahead. have three uncles who were like 
like I, I think I've said it a number of times on our, our episodes before, but my uncles were like fathers to me. So it wasn't my father that was addicted, but I had three uncles who were addicted while I was coming up. Um, I even went to meetings when I was a teenager with my one uncle because I wanted, we were that close. Like I wanted to be a part of his recovery. Um, and like Auntie Suge, because of my relationship with my uncles and my closeness to that, I said I would never work with addictions. I didn't want to. It was something I didn't want to do. But I realized early on that you can say you don't want to work with addictions, but addiction is going to come to you as a therapist. It's going to come even in your regular clients. It's going to show up. So it's something that you have to actually deal with and process through for yourself in order to be able to work with those clients. Um, so it's, it's a really odd thing for me. And I think I might hold off on, on talking about just my feelings about addiction and about you know, how we go about it um, and the different models that people align with. But yeah, I think most people have in some way experienced it, experienced having an addicted family member or good friend or watch somebody, even even college students. We In college, we know that we party and we drink, but people really don't know that a lot of those friends are becoming binge drinkers and that pushes you towards alcoholism. So we see it in all facets of life and we don't always, you know, want to pay attention to it or want it to be what it actually is. But how could people glorify it? True. People yeah. glorify drug use. Especially now. You know, like, it's the music industry now. Yeah. Like, when you hear rap lyrics, like you hear and you hear lyrics to music. They talk about how they was high or um, you know, Molly and like they like they make it sound cool. You might get all fun and games until you've been yeah. affected. And and I will say, when it comes to the music industry, that's been there forever. Like a lot of people want to blame that on hip hop solely. No, it's been there forever. Like I didn't know until I was grown that Candy by Cameo is about cocaine. It's literally about his love of cocaine. And they play that at weddings for the electric slide. So it's been prevalent in music forever. But now it seems like the artists now are like glorifying it more and like they really open about their use and they don't see it as addiction. They don't even see it as addiction. And I'm like, this is more than just recreational. This is beyond recreational use at this point. Yeah. And that's, um, that's where like should auntie should psycho ed with auntie should, if you haven't watched the mini, go ahead and go watch it. Shameless plug. Like auntie Ash says, um, but she was talking about the, the spectrum of addiction as well to where it goes from it's, it's recreational. You're using, every now and then socially just for fun and then it gets to the point where your body is asking for it and begging you for it and you're doing any and everything you can to find it and at that point that's where you're addicted to it um so i have had i have family members who drink a lot who smoke weed um and it's a little more than the recreational and i have i have some uncles who are like functional alcoholics like they can drink all day long still get up go to work, do whatever they need to do. But I always have wondered, like, like they would never say it, what it is that's hurting them. But what is it that's really hurting you that got you to the point where you have to drink every day? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking like self-esteem or self-confidence or like there's, there's always an underlying reason, but I know it goes deeper than just like, I want to drink because it feels good. It's, tr it's trauma. I, you there will never get me to say it's not some trauma behind anybody who overindulges and not necessarily to the addict phase, but even if you overindulge and you're not an addict, there's a reason for that. It's, it, it goes outside of the realm of fun when you're doing it, when you're alone or when that like other factors come into play and it's like, no, what is really bothering you that you have to escape so much? So for some people, it's, it's not always trauma. A lot of people, it is trauma where they're trying to escape or, you know, some people, it quiets the noise down in their brain. That's why people who are who have ADHD or um, bipolar disorder that are untreated are likely to become not. I won't say likely because not everybody, but um, have the propensity to become an addict in the future because some people just want to shut it down. They just want to shut down their brain, and then once they start it, you know, they find something that they don't have to be connected to all the time. They don't have to hear all this extra noise in their hearts and in their brains, and they're just like, you know what? All right, I'll let it take over. And then when she says it's spectrum me, it always starts small. 
somebody's always like, oh, I just drink on the weekends, or I just drink on, on this, at, you know, at parties. And it's always like, oh, okay, well, I just have a six-pack a night. Oh, I just have a six-pack three times out of the week. And then before you know it, you're climbing that, that addiction hill. And um, I think even in our community, we're just like, oh, that's my aunt. She's been doing that forever. She's going to get drunk, and then she's going to go pass out, and it's going to be fine. And we normalize it. And that's the problem. I, I think we normalize it, especially when it's adults, because we're like, until they're ready to take accountability, it's nothing I can do anyway. I can I can harp all day. You need to stop drinking. You need to stop doing this. You need to, until, especially once they are at that end of the spectrum where they're addicted, until they are ready, ain't nothing I can say that's going to make them change. That's going to take that away. So I think that's why we try to normalize it because how other, what other way am I going to cope with it? Yes, it bothers me that my family member is drunk at a party or high. It, and it, yes, it's bothersome, but I also, that's a full grown adult and I can't make them change. And I think that's what people don't understand. You can't make anybody change. You also don't have to enable them, but you you can't make them change. I think that, I think that when you speak about coping, I think that that is also something that isn't talked about enough. Coping with alcohol or with the drug is technically what people always resort to, but how do we give them other coping skills? Having them go for a walk. Like people sometimes don't know that they have that option because it's never presented to them as an option. And so I think the coping part is where a lot of specifically our community gets left out of when it comes to like resources and stuff like, hey, let's take a walk. Let's let's talk about some stuff or go for a walk to give yourself some thoughts uh, or think about your thoughts for a while or even engage in some humor. Watch some comedy if you're feeling upset about something instead of going to drink or something that's going to replace that level of that level of um I don't know that level of excitement or that level of I don't know whatever the re the feeling that needs to be replaced you can replace it with another activity that's giving you the same type of feeling um but oftentimes it's it's alcohol or drugs because it's accessible and but then what's the, the difference between coping and management? Because now we, we we talk about the illicit drugs and alcohol is legal. So that's another reason why it's so hard for people to look at alcohol like this bad thing, because we can go buy liquor legally. Um, and marijuana in a lot of states is legal now. But what's the difference between coping and managing then? Because on the one hand, if you are, say you smoking weed, will say you have a maladaptive coping mechanism. But if you go get an antidepressant pill from your doctor, you're managing. What's the difference? I, I'll take that one. Because even though doctors give you pills, doctors are not just giving you the same kind of street drugs that you're getting on the street. So there are like 235 different components in weed that we don't even know. And this is in the purest weed that we don't even know what they are. And so the minute you introduce those different components into somebody's brain and you don't even know how it's already structured and it's already damaged because it's not healthy because they're already addicts, then you're adding to the problem. And then when you're like genetically predisposed, you're adding to a problem that you might that people might not even know that they already have. Now, when you go and go get a pharmaceutical and I don't push big pharma because I don't care. But when you go and go get a pharmaceutical um, that stuff is, some of it is regulated. You know, you might be getting a micro dose that'll keep your brain healthy. Um, I deal in pharmaceuticals and how they help certain people. And so I've seen people addicted to, uh, meth, but then you go and go get methadone and it can help you wean off the meth addiction. And so it's also like another kind of form of harm reduction. And so whenever we add street drugs into the mix, it makes it more dangerous. See, and this is why this is a tough topic for me because my my views are very different. And there are therapists who, who agree with my views on it, but then there are staunch opponents to it. Like I, I don't view pharmaceutical drugs any different from street drugs in a lot of ways. And now we do have medicinal marijuana. And I just, it's very hard for me to say, let's give you all these pills because we think we know what, what they'll do. We think they'll work for your brain. Because at the end of the day, any chemical can have an adverse effect on your brain, whether regulated or not. And 
there are pills out there. When we see commercials on TV for certain pills, at the end of the commercial, real quiet, they're telling you all of these things that might happen, all of these risk factors, all of these things to look out for. So they still come with their elements of possible issue. But we look at it like if a doctor gave it to us, it's okay. Just like when doctors were giving people opioids and now you have pill addicts out here because of that. But that's a that's a prescribed pill, but they overdid it. So there's a very thin line, even with your legal medications, where they can become a problem. So I, for me, I'm just more, I'm more, if we can go a natural way, I feel better. Not that I'm totally against medication, but if we can go a natural way, I feel better. And I tell all my clients, I am a pro-cannabis therapist. I think that it's a better thing to consider as opposed to a lot of pharmaceutical medications. Just like me wanting to get into psychedelics. Yeah, but so here, so, oh, go ahead. Jim. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Am. No, I was just going to say, um, in the most respectful way, <laughs> I'm hearing you say a lot of I think, I think, I think. But when it comes down to it, there's also science involved and not just what we think and what we believe and what we have imagined could happen or couldn't happen. There is science involved in it. Any medication has side effects. Cough medicine, um, headache pills, what is it, ibuprofen, like all the medicines have side effects to it. But there is science involved when it comes to the hormones in your brain and the chemicals and all of that. And when it comes to addiction, it, it's it's a it's just a very different issue than it is for other things. So I would I I would trust the science for the most part, but also just be cautious. Like do your research as well. Like don't just take your first doctor's word for it and say, oh well, this doctor said right. I need to take this medication. Okay, well I'm gonna go take it. Oh shit, I had this side effect. I ain't never taking medication again for this. This is stupid. No, just like any other medical condition that you have, anything cancer, you're always gonna get a second or third professional mm -hmm. opinion on that. I'd like to I'd like to give you a different perspective on coping versus management. Coping, when you talk about, let's just say marijuana and using that as a depression versus a antidepressant, I would say that with the management is different because if you have good providers, they're supposed to be a team. You are supposed to have a therapist on your team, a psychiatrist on your team, a nurse on your team, and any other wraparound services that you need. So when it comes to management, to me, management would be okay, I have a team of people that's going to help me address this problem versus me coping on my own with my homeboys or with my homegirls. Just, you know, we just shooting the shit and shooting the breeze and we're just talking about life and I'm not really addressing the problem versus your management team should be your wraparound team to help you manage the problem. And so, and we know that from research, it says therapy and medication is your best combination. So I would, I would say from a management, the diff, that's the difference for me between coping I agree. and I agree. versus management. And I have clients who have medicinal marijuana and I'm their therapist. So they are talking to a therapist. Um, and I just want to just real quick answer what Auntie Amber said. I'm saying, I think, because it's still my opinion, but when it comes to the science, we tend to be biased in that area. We are, of course, going to latch on to the science that we agree with. We will latch on to the research we agree with. And there's also there's always research on the opposing side. Like right now, there are a lot of therapists who do not agree with psychedelic assisted therapy to, to even help with addiction. They're using they're trying to use psychedelic assisted therapy to do that now, which was always the purpose of psychedelics until people started using it recreationally. And, they, and the government decided to snatch it. But there is research to support that other end, just like there's research to support harm reduction. But you have some addiction specialists who do not agree with harm reduction at all. They agree with total abstinence, like your NA and your AA programs. So you will find no matter what side you fall on, you're going to find uh, the research to support your side. So I wanted to talk a little bit about harm reduction and um, Auntie Ashley mentioned um, like, you know, that some, some therapists are not proponents of harm reduction. And um, I think I'm on the fence about harm reduction. What harm reduction is, is if somebody is addicted to 
meth, then you'll get some people in the community that will provide them the needles so that they're not, you know, shooting up with dirty needles. And they'll say, okay, maybe don't do it 20 times a day. Maybe do it 10 times a day. Okay, now that you're at 10 times a day, maybe do it five times a day. All right, maybe do it three times a day. And harm reduction is really similar to like doing methadone treatments in that way because you're still weaning somebody off of something. However, there is a component of it that if you are giving an addict the drug constantly, um, even if it's weed, if you're giving somebody who's addicted to cocaine weed, those same pleasure centers are getting activated. So your your brain is not like, oh, shoot, this is just a little bit of weed. Let me just get a little bit of weed that the government gave me. Your brain is like, oh, shoot, we getting it popping. You know what I mean? We, we, we back there? We there again? And so then those, those neurons are firing in there. And your brain that you've already, that you're teaching how to not be hijacked anymore is now slowly being taken over once again. That's why it's not good for addicts to go ahead and have a little bit of this and a little bit of that and dab a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And so when we would have to go to seminars, because I was an addiction specialist for three years. And so whenever we would have to go to seminars, we would have to learn about all the things and then kind of make the judgments around there. And then having the experience also kind of just puts me in the realm of abstinence and that's the reason why they say total abstinence is because your brain being hijacked and then letting somebody take over a little bit what does that look like when you hijack an airplane i talked about it in my psychoeducation when you hijack an airplane um it's completely taken over you're sitting there and you're watching while somebody else drives it into the ground that's addiction and so if you say well let me let my brain get a little bit hijacked you're still not watching you're still crashing and burning in the same kind of way okay can i can i give the official just I happen to have it up because it's in my files. Can I just give the official short definition of harm reduction? Because Auntie Suge is right, but that's also how addiction specialists refer to it. But I just wanted to give the official, like what the harm reduction, what the researchers have coined it. And I'm just going to read it straight from the page. So harm reduction refers to a range of public health policies designed to lessen the negative social and or physical consequences associated with various human behaviors, both legal and illegal. It is used to decrease negative consequences of re recreational drug use and sexual activity without requiring abstinence. Recognizing that those unable or unwilling to stop can still make positive change to protect themselves and others. So see that definition, how I learned it is why I agree with it. That's fine, agree away. Addiction specialists came up with the whole concept of harm reduction, but it was those addiction specialists that didn't necessarily agree that total abstinence can work for everyone. The definition was the same as what I said, but what she's talking about um, and what the definition was explaining was helping people who may not be able to just have total abstinence, which everybody's different, right? Some, some people can't just have total abstinence. But when you go into an AA program or an NA program or people who have actually been addicted for 20 to 30 years, you can't give them a little bit of crack. You can't give them a little bit of that and say, you know, especially in, and then expect them to be a lot of bit healed. And so in the meantime, in theory, it sounds great. But when you're that child and you are being um, abused because your parents is on, your parent is on drugs or when you're being neglected because your parent is on drugs, you don't want them to have a little bit of stuff because guess what? It still shows up in your life while somebody's trying to ha do harm reduction. And so that's why some people don't agree with it because when you're not being affected, it's easy to say it. It's just like administrators making up, um, school curriculums. They are not even in it. And so sometimes they don't understand it to that effect. And that's like that, even from being an addicted child, I'm in a, a child of addiction or whatever, or, and just watching it and working in it. When somebody's life is being affected, sometimes you just don't have the time to say, well, let me just go ahead and reduce harm because somebody is still being caused harm. If that makes sense. It does. It makes sense. I think I'm just trying to view it from. Hold on. Keish was saying oh, something. Go ahead, I, I was just I was just agreeing with you, Shug. I do I do think it makes sense. Um, I don't work. Pers I am now in the again going back to the addictions community or the opiate community. 
let's just say that the well not opiate community people who are affected by the opiate crisis let me just switch my words up um and one of the things i use as you know a therapist is the trans theoretical model which is basically the stages of change and a lot of individuals who like you said shook you know are expecting straight some people may be expecting straight abstinence other people they need some time. And so when you use a trans theoretical model, and for those who need a definition, it's a model of behavior change is an integrative theory of therapy that assesses an individual's readiness to act on a new healthier behavior and provide strategies or processes of change to guide the individual. So I use that as a way when it comes to harm reduction see what stages of change they want to be in because you're right you can't change you can't make people stop doing drugs you just can't because their brain is hijacked so working that step by step in those stages of change is how how i've been able to address addiction in the community that i work with and speaking of working in the opiate population or the population affected by opiates uh harm reduction and the policies that they put in place let's just say from a federal level has been astronomical and i only know this because i had to compare it to how they funded gun yeah. violence and it is very different because this when it comes to the opiates affect mostly white men white men and women versus we know gun violence affects mostly black men um when it comes to homicide suicide is still white men but when it comes to the opiates white men are still dying at high rates or affected by the opiate crisis but recent research showed that black men are on the rise or the second leading group to engage in opiates and so that's a very astonishing thing for me to know i mean we know about like the crack era and i when i think about harm reduction i think about how black men and women were treated in the crack era and how they mm -hmm. had to be sent to fucking jail versus the white community is getting all these policies of harm reduction they're getting places where you can go now and, you know, use safe and clean syringes. Uh, they have now, now we treat medical teams to integrate substance use. We didn't do that before. They are doing, they are creating all types of treatment centers. I know a hospital right now that did an entire floor, detox floor, incorporated in their hospital to address the opiate and just, let's just say, substance use altogether. So for me, when it comes to harm reduction, do I feel like it's needed? Yes. But do I feel like it's proportionate yeah. to everyone? No. No. That, yeah. That is, what, that is what I do not believe we have caught up with because it mostly affects white men now granted it's on the rise for black men but in the research that i read black men are less likely to receive help they're less likely to get help so that puts an extra layer on okay we can have these policies in place but it's everybody utilizing it exactly and is it for everybody and, and that that goes into the war on drugs right so in the 80s and mm -hmm. the 70s people were given a little bit of crack you know what i mean and and, and it's been pushed into our communities and so they push it into our communities and it wasn't us. Cause like, uh, like, like Ice Cube said, we ain't got no boats and stuff like that. So we went, uh, driving it over here. Um, and it was pushed. In. <laughs> we don't, we don't have that. We was just sitting there and it dropped on everybody's head. And like, you know what I mean? Some people started using it. And so once you get the black community hooked on crack cocaine, which is detrimental to everybody, there is no harm reduction in that for me. Don't touch it. And so whenever, it got dropped on everybody and it started destroying our black families. It started destroying our black men, our black women. And there's so many crack babies made from that era. And then all of a sudden there's a war on drugs. Mm -hmm. And so now you put the drugs in the community and then make a war on drugs. And then now you can put a whole bunch of black people in prison. And then now we have a bunch of kids growing up without their parents because their parents has been put into prison. And then all of a sudden, you know, everybody wants to be in the pop culture, right? We are the pop culture. And so now you get white boys and white girls and they're hooked on the college students. They're hooked on stuff. You know what I mean? They're hooked on, um, the closest thing to Adderall is meth. They're hooked on meth, um, because they started using Adderall and studying in college and, you know, overuse their Adderall. So now they're hooked on it. And now there's an opioid crisis and that's garbage. I fully agree. It was criminal when it was us. It's a health issue now. And, the, and that's why we have harm reduction in all of these things, because it's a health issue now. And that can speak to how addiction in and of itself has been viewed. You have different models. 
Some people view it as a medical. It's a medical model. You have a moral model. There's several different models on how you can look at addiction. Now it is more viewed as a psychosocial medical model. All these things are involved and we need to take care of these people. When it was us, they, we were criminals. Drug addicts, drug dealers, all of us were criminals. Everybody was criminalized. We were put in jail. And that's my whole point. What would it have looked like in the 80s if they had looked at us like people and considered it a health issue and an epidemic and gave us harm reduction and programs and all these things? Yes, harm reduction in and of itself is not the whole answer, but to start somebody there to try to get them to a better place, they didn't even do that for us then. But, well, for now, so for now, right? Because, you know, fa back to the future. If we think about it, now they're talking about harm reduction and now harm reduction is not the only way. And so one thing Keith started talking about is she was talking about engaging your parasympathetic nervous system. Oh, my God. Are you in that damn parasympathetic <laughs> nervous system? <laughs> that, that's for my friend who's always talking about it. Um, she was talking about that, like going for walks, um, talking about what's really bothering you. A lot of these people we see on drugs in the streets, you have never asked them, but why? Why are you on drugs? Some people have been raped since they were little girls. Some people haven't been abused. And they didn't just say, you know what? I think I'll try drugs today. Some people was just like, wow, you know, this is the only way that I can cope. And that has been their coping mechanism. So when you say, ain't nothing I could do, that's a lie. There is something that you could do. Because the biggest thing that you could do is get somebody into treatment. They may leave treatment 99 times, but you get them in there 100. And so I agree with what, Keish, what Auntie Keish was saying when she was talking about, you know, engage them in other ways if you have somebody with ocd obsessive compulsive disorder and they can't stop digging in their nose you're going to put something in their hands that's the same thing that you could do for somebody who's on drugs you could put something else in their hands and give them something else to but do. now how far does that go because now you're talking about the person who's trying to help this person in their mental health how far does that go when is enough enough i've tried a hundred times to get you help i've been there for years i've strained myself to get you the help that you do not want. That's what I meant by I can't make you do anything. So how much do you give of yourself to get someone help that they don't want? Well, I, I'm a very big avid of meeting people where they are. Sometimes we will be able to talk to until we blue in the face and that person still yeah. won't budge. And so I think it's now as a therapist, it's using more the trans theoretical model as I explained see walking them through the stages of changing where they are but as a, if you i were on the personal end i meet people where they are and sometimes sometimes even though that may not feel good setting boundaries with individuals like hey this this is i really want you to be sober when you come over to the our house party you can engage in whatever you need to after we get done or i'm only gonna you know if you need to go upstairs and drink by yourself or whatever you need to do please don't do it around my children please don't be so you can set those parameters you can set those boundaries for people so i i'm the person that believes in meeting people where they are and setting boundaries doesn't mean you don't less that love that person less I mean, it doesn't mean that you are condoning what they're doing you just have to be you have to figure out like you said how much of this am i gonna push on myself and then I'm not getting anywhere. And now I'm I'm more exhausted and working harder than you are. So I'm a big person of just meeting people where they are and setting them. Mm -hmm. But to, for somebody to be able to do that, they have to be able to look at it from a similar perspective as we're all saying today. Because if you're looking at this person and saying like, oh my God, you continue to choose to do this and make stupid choices. And like, you're an idiot and you're dumb and you just keep doing this. Like, why do you keep doing this? I don't understand. They're not gonna have the empathy and the compassion to actually be patient enough to figure out where this person is to meet them there. So, and I guess I'm, I'm talking to the viewers too, in, in terms of like changing your own mindset and really taking in what you're hearing today and looking at it from a different, different perspective, instead of assuming that you know what you know, and that's what you and your family have been thinking for the past 10, 15, 20 years. So that's what it is. Well, no, now we have more information and more knowledge to, to, damn it, sorry, it's my dog but more knowledge to share. Um, and you can look at it differently and then that will allow you to have the empathy and the patience and the passion, I mean, the compassion to, to sit with that person and say, okay, you know what? It looks like you're not quite ready to 
change or stop or do anything different, but this is how I can support you. Maybe just even being there. Because a lot mm -hmm. of the times, too, we push them away. Like, I've seen in my own family, well, in my husband's family, um, how people are, are pushed away for for their addictions. Like, they don't, the family doesn't understand. They're frustrated. They're tired of it. Like Ashley's saying, they've strained themselves so much trying to get this person to stop and to change. They're like, I don't want to have anything to do with you. That person gets pushed away. They go right back into the addiction even further, deeper. And like nobody's being helped there because then the family mm -hmm. doesn't like that either. So it's just change your perspective. You can change how you feel about it. You can approach it in a different way. I agree. It's another thing too with like changing your perspective is um, when we talk about like how much we are, how much we are going to take. Sometimes it seems like people don't get it together until there's something jarring that happens. Like, you know, somebody die and all of a sudden you don't have that support. And so now that that, that person is dead, now you, also, now you all of a sudden have to get it together. And it's not necessarily a, a want. People who are on drugs and need drugs to survive and are doing the most dishonorable things in the streets don't want to do that. And I think that that's where um, we make a mistake. They don't want to be out there like that. They're out there like that because their brain is hijacked and they can't help it at some point. And just um, like like Amber said, with boundaries, that's a big thing, but also shunning people too. I've heard people get called all types of disgusting names out there and that just brings on more shame. I agree, I agree. I have... oh. I'd like to add one more thing. Now this may make people feel uncomfortable and I'm, and I'm okay with that. I have worked with individuals affected by addiction. And one of the things that a lot of people don't talk about or that I don't see talk about a lot is death. People are going to die from their addiction. And I had to get a very, I had to get a reality check when that happened because I was with a client one day picking up her child for her to have visits. And the next day she was gone. And I, it, while it's uncomfortable to hear that is the reality of addiction if someone continues to go down that path. And so I just wanted to mention that, that even though we want to help this person go to the, so the, they can get all the treatment that they can get. They can, you know, have the, the best team. However, there are some individuals who won't be with us because of their addiction. And so I wanted to put that out there that, that may that may also be an outcome even though we may not want that outcome that may be an outcome that can happen and it probably has happened to a lot of people yeah that's that's the that's the truth yeah. of it that's like a cold hard truth of it and also with death even if we don't want to go to that extent even people who have been addicted to drugs and do get clean there are existing health conditions that then they cannot get rid of they will live with for the rest of their lives due to their years of drug abuse. So even if the person get clean and they don't die, they, they live the rest of their life. They might have certain heart issues, other issues that stem from that drug use. So that's got to be something that you understand. They, all these things that come with it and death being that final thing. Like we're talking physical death, but there, like figuratively speaking, there's also a death that occurs too. And that they're not the same person that they used to be. Um, they may not have the same full range of affect that I had prior to using. Um, so even, and I'm not saying all, some people, even when some people do are successfully, um, I don't know the word, but c come off the drugs and they're not using anymore, they may not be the same person that they were before. And family members have a hard time with that too, because you're no longer the lively loving, caring, you know, spunky person that you used to be. And that's also sad. So there's another type of grief, maybe not as severe as if it was a physical death, but there's another type of grief and loss that you deal with there too. Oh, You're so right, point. Amber. Mm -hmm. You're so right. There, yeah, that becomes, you become a different person. Um, and some people aren't understanding of those changes. So I, I definitely agree. You know, with, with those changes too, um, 
I think that people have a hard time in themselves with those changes. And, you know, they might not like having to live like the, the clean lifestyle because it's nice to have an escape. Um, you know, sometimes we go out and we drink. What Think about whenever we finish completing a doctoral program. What do we do? I just want to go have a drink. I want to go somewhere and go escape. I just need my brain to be off of this. Sure they don't did. have that mechanism anymore. They can't say, oh, shoot, I finally got something to drink to and I can't drink. They can't, they can't do that. And so um, I was sharing earlier that when you are finally off of your device, off of your vice, one thing people always question, and I don't understand it. If you say, I don't drink, people get mad when you say, I don't drink. And it's like, I don't, I don't have to drink for you. Why do I have to drink for you? And so um, the better thing to say for addicts is I already had enough or I had one too many. People don't question that. They always question you not drinking, but they will never question you having too much. I was always I was always taught in class that people who have any type of addiction, they're always in recovery. So I always think about that whenever um whenever I'm around somebody who may be, you know, in recovery and I think about all the things that surround them that trigger them and how they could be triggered at any moment. And it's important to think that they're always in this recovery. So even with my dad, like he was on drugs and alcohol. I think it was just drugs. And, you know, I think about any time that he could have a stressful day at work because he works in the kitchen. And he also works with other guys who are engaged in drugs. So at any moment of time, he could go, he could relapse at any moment. And so I always think about his life and the type of stuff he's doing to keep himself engaged and that anything could set him back. And so that's, it's important that's to think about part. that. Yeah, and that, that brings on... Oh, I'm sorry. Go that's ahead, that's sorry. a difficult part for a lot of people because a lot of times the, the different addictions programs will tell you you have to change your environment, you have to change the people you are around, you have to change all these things. And for some people, that's like, oh, so I need to not be around family members. Like, there are people I love that you're telling me I now cannot be around if I want to remain clean. And that's very hard. But it brought up something when you mentioned that yeah. to uh, both you and Auntie Shug. When Auntie Shug said people want to bring up your past, how do y'all feel about the idea of continuing to refer to yourself as an addict? Like, I've been to NA and AA meetings with my uncle. And they always start with, hi, my name is such and such, and I'm an addict, no matter how long they've been clean. So it's like a constant reminder, yes, I'm an addict, even though I'm clean. So how do y'all feel about that? Because that, to me, doesn't acknowledge a change. That means you're going to always refer to yourself as this, as a constant reminder of who you once were. It's, it's I'm important. not an addict, so it's... I don't... I let people refer to themselves how they want to. I'm not an addict. I'm, I've never been addicted to anything, and it's not my place to feel any certain type of way, at least for me, I'd let them tell me what they want to be referred as. I think what I've learned, I can't say I'm not an addict either, but what I've learned is that it's important for you to always refer to yourself as that because it's just like, if you have an allergy, if you are allergic to strawberries and you no longer eat strawberries, you know, you're not going to say, um, I used to be allergic to strawberries. You're going to always say that's my allergy. I can't have it. And so when they constantly say, I'm an addict. It's a reminder that I can't do that. The things that other people think that they can do, I can't do. And so in acknowledging that you're an addict is the biggest flex on anybody. Because when you say I'm an addict, but I don't do that anymore, nobody can say anything to you. And so it's, a, it's acknowledging that you have this allergy, that you will not be partaking in shellfish today. You will not be partaking in strawberries today. I can't have that because my body does not like it. It's a rejection for me. I actually you talking uh, about in a clinical sense or just in general talking to no I was I guess I must have under, when I misunderstood brought up because I actually read a couple of articles about this in the last place that I worked um, because my last supervisor was a licensed addictions counselor as well so she wanted all of us to become addictions counselors and I said no but I'm willing to learn stuff but um it, it got brought up that now you have a lot of like you have a lot of different places that are trying to change the terminology so that that you're not consistently saying I'm an addict because that still plays on your psyche. If I'm calling myself this, 
how do I acknowledge my change and how do I how do I say my past is my past if I'm continuing to call myself this? So it's been talked about among like different professional circles and they changed the language in some areas. And I read a, a research article that basically said it was basically questioning, is it a good thing to have these people still refer to themselves as an addict if you want them to be able to say, I have changed and that's my past? You can't. The one person in the article said, you can't say don't judge them on their past and then consistently tell them they have to keep calling themselves an addict. I, it, it, it goes to, it goes back to identity for me because um, like, I'm always looking at, well, I work with a lot with teenagers. So I work a lot with that identity formation phase and all of that, but how you refer to yourself is how you identify, right? So if I ask you, who are you? The first thing usually you're, teenagers are going to say is their name but then I am you know a female I'm an athlete I'm this I'm that and you know addict I don't like using that term I, I say for like when I'm talking about people who have used drugs I would just say people who have used drugs I try not to use that term like in a clinical sense but um for someone who's been through it if that is a part of who you are because like Suge is saying it's something that you've dealt with for a really long time and you can't really get rid of it like you can't you're always going to be tempted when you're in places where that thing is there. So it is a part of you, but also remembering that there are like 10 other parts of you as well. So if you allow that part of you to take over your identity, absolutely, you're probably going to relapse, like higher risk of that. But if you recognize that, okay, yes, maybe you have had been addicted to drugs in the past and maybe your body is still, you know, tempted, um, but also you are now a family person and you're you're a father and you are a grandfather and you are a um chef and you're this you're that and you're adding all these parts of that person's identity then they can look at how that has changed because at one point in their life addict was like 95 percent of their identity but if they look at their life now and they realize okay that's just a small part of it i have all these other things going on then they can see that change but still right. acknowledge what they went through and that they still are tempted i agree i agree with that and also relapse you touched on relapse relapse i don't know why i didn't touch on relapse relapse is expected you have to expect relapse like you expect somebody to drink some some water because when you are an addict and when you are addicted to something if it's in the vicinity they're going to want to use it and remember, we talked about your brain being hijacked. It's not, a, it's not a willpower. There is no devil on your shoulder and the other one saying, do it, don't do it, don't do it. It's not like that. It's like my brain sees it and I'm going for it. And so when you constantly remind yourself, I'm an addict, I can't have that. That's, what, that's when you're reaffirming who you are. I, I'm an addict who knows I can't use this drug. And I got other stuff going on. My dad is a grandfather. He's a, he's a better father than, you know, than he was forever when he was on drugs. Um, he, you know, I mean, he's just the person that he is, is bomb. And we're able to see that person shine through now that there is not confounded by any substance. And so I think that the identity, he always says I'm an addict and with no shame and everybody that I've even counseled and, you know, coached throughout their addiction has no shame because it's like, that's what I'm, I'm allergic to that. I can't have that. I, yeah, I, I, can, I can see that from that perspective then. I, I can see that. And I, I agree with that to keep <laughs> let people identify however they want to that helps them. Like if that's, if that helps you to do that, then of course identify as you want. I think like Auntie Amber mm -hmm. said, it's terminology for me. Like it, it comes, it's, it comes off very negative when you say addict, just like it would come off negative if I, if I say crackhead, but you were a crackhead. Or if I say dope fiend, but you were a dope fiend, but those sound horrible so this is why even in the in the dsm it's substance use or substance abuse disorder it's not it, it, it's not the things that sound more like name calling so like i tend to say substance abuser you are a substance abuser instead of an addict because that word has the same connotation for me as me calling you a crackhead or a don't see it still sound just bad what, substance abuser? That, yeah. that sound it's just, just it's bad not, it's just what yeah. it has what yeah. do you say, drug yeah. addict, substance abuser, whatever? It sounds just as bad. Now, it's you just can, putting a bow you on can some do the person first terminology like we've learned in the mental health field, the, a person who has mm -hmm. used or something like that, if you want it to sound a little better. But saying substance abuser, you still calling that person a drug addict, essentially. It's it sounds the same to me. But I, I'm That's not. Why. 
yeah, I haven't, I haven't been addicted to drugs in the past, so I don't, I don't know how that would sound for someone. But I and and most people, most people don't go around saying, "Oh, hey, I'm I'm such and such, and and I'm no, a crackhead." Like that's not how they talk about themselves. When they say I'm an addict, they put a lot of positivity to that, so that they don't feel the stigma that we think that they might be feeling. They just feel like, you know, I mean, this is what I am. Uh, when you get somebody who is unashamed of who they are, you will get some grandmas that say, yeah, I used to be a hoe. And they'll say it and they don't care. That was OP Valley, because it's like, that's what I used to be. Why do we have to bring in grandmas? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And why are we okay. back on grandmas again? This is like the really? episode <laughs> at this point. Well, you'll get a grandma. We need a grandma. Saying, I used to be a hoe. Sure. But that's <laughs> why I don't live there no more. So since I'm I don't sorry, live there, you, you move out just, too. I did not bring up <laughs> P-Valley <laughs> because you still ain't watched it. But Pastor Woodbine got on TV on the show and said, I used to suck a lot of... I used she to sure did. <laughs> <laughs> she had no shame. She, she was running for mayor. And she was like, y'all already know oh my God, yeah. what I used to be. Now, do you want me to be a good mayor or not? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, huh. that's that's what they saying. I, I don't live there no more. Now you move out of that house too, because we moved. Mm -hmm. I, I was a hoe. I ain't no hoe no more. You know what? You know what y'all made me think of? Like once we get off here, I'm gonna go ask my dad. Now I know he don't speak for every person who has you know used drugs, but I really want to ask him. Like, how does he feel about that terminology? Does he use that terminology? And if this is something that may be different, you know, with him learning peer recovery, how he addresses his, the men that he, you know, coach and talk to in his house, in the recovery house. So I'm going to do a little bit of experimenting, I guess, nice. you know, talking. Sounds right. On a bright note, I love watching people flourish after they've, um, you know, I mean, after they come out of that for the people who do, who do come out of that, I love watching them flourish and get their lives together. And I've had some clients die. And as a therapist, it's so hard. It is so hard because you feel like you're the failure. I felt like I was a failure. I'll talk about me. I felt like if he went back to doing whatever he was doing, I'm the failure. And it's not true. Um, people are going to do what their brain tells them to do. Your brain tells you to eat, you're going to eat. Their brain tells them to, you know, that they need drugs, they need drugs. And so it's never on us or anybody else whenever somebody passes from their habits. Um, so I just want to put that out there because on a bright note, some people do get off and they flourish. I just said, you know, my dad is doing very well and I will never, ever, ever hold him to who he was 12, 15, 16 years ago, because you know what? When people grow, they don't need a constant reminder of what they used to do or what, the, you know, what they used to be. When people grow, you got to allow them to grow and then you grow with them. Sounds right. So when we talk about different types of relationships between mothers and daughters, control is often a huge factor. But whenever a parent does start to lose control or they feel like they don't have that control over their, their child anymore, then they start to display some like really dysregulated <clears throat> and odd behaviors. And sometimes it's negative things. Sometimes it seems like when you get those parents that, that, that don't want their kid to grow up or, to, or you know, that don't want their child to grow up is also they don't want them to make the same mistakes that they did. And so then they try to exert control over them that way. So it's like, Oh, I don't want you to grow up and do the things that I did. So let me streamline everything that you do for you. It is very hard to talk to parents when a, you know, when they don't allow their children to live life or don't allow their children to learn certain things because they're so scared of the world doing something to their child that they can't control. When actual reality, you can't control anybody, it, not even your kid. And one thing you miss too, how young somebody becomes a mother. If you are dealing with a teenage mother, she's still a child. Teenagers are not grown. So if you're dealing with a teenage mother who doesn't know who she is yet and still trying to figure out her identity, and now she's a mother to a child, 
you notice that sometimes I notice in those relationships where that mother and child are really, really close friends from the very beginning. It looks almost like a friendship instead of a parent child relationship. So, um, I actually have been blessed to have had a really close relationship to my mom over like my entire life. I can't think, I can't think of it. Try to turn your camera off. Cause you know what's going on. Like, why are you still laughing? All I know is Amber started laughing. She'd be so serious and she'd just be sitting there. Like, she don't say nothing. She'd just be like, just like a creeper. Blank I'd face. be thinking, you know what? Fuck y'all. Do that. <laughs> How about that? Fuck y'all. How about that? <laughs> Fuck y'all. How about that? <laughs>